Hi, it's Ryan here from Peer Pro. Welcome to our new podcast. For more details, get in touch. Visit peproapp.com. Welcome to the Peer Pro podcast. My name is Ryan Hudson. And today we've got a special guest on the show. We've got Tony Cunningham, 28 years, deputy head. Tony, welcome to P Pro Podcast. How are you doing? Yeah, great. Thanks, Ryan. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm really, really well. Thank you. Um, and uh, yeah, just enjoyed watching the Wigan and Hull game last night. We've managed to scrape a result, so even happier this morning. Yeah, excellent. Well, it's great to have you. It's great to have you on board. Uh, and today we're just, just going to have a chat about you know the journey, uh, but also you know this this P Pro Podcast is about how P and sport can change lives. You as a, as, as a you know, former uh, head of PE and the vice principal, uh, where's the journey start? Where did the journey start, Tony? Um, well, as I may have just given a bit of a clue there, I come from the wrong side of the hill. So I guess um, it, it, a little place called uh, Platte Bridge near Wigan. And uh, I think my parents, first of all, my dad was very keen on sport. I'm one of six. I've got five sisters. And we were very competitive at home. My dad would have us doing all kinds of things, feats of strength, jumping over a high jump over a clothes prop that he would set up. And you got your shins cut to Billy O. But, you know, it was it was good fun. And we used to be racing against each other, including my dad. But I think I was very, very fortunate. The primary school I went to in particular um, was in those days, you had a, a really strong uh, school team uh, fixture scenario, even at junior school. And uh, my school, Holy Family School in Blackbridge near Wigan, was uh, everybody, every lad's dream was to get in the rugby team. Uh, and uh, I'm very fortunate that I managed to get into the school rugby team. And that was that was a big deal early on. So I think the die was probably cast then, really, really early on. The school had that, you know, my, my uncle before me and my cousins played for the school team. And so it was quite a big deal. And Mr. Rin, bless him, who was the... the I can't remember if he's the head teacher or the deputy head. He took all the rugby teams. And so really early on, that 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 a good habit and that die, my passion for particularly for rugby for sport was was set up, I guess. So the so interesting there. So the the primary teacher back there, obviously rugby Wigan because we know a big rugby town is there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was the teacher that got you into that as well, then basically. It Pete. was. He was, and th- this gentleman, I imagine teacher was a, di- a lot different. He actually used to take his nine iron and a bag of golf balls onto the pitch uh, at, at lunchtime at school. And we would all s- s- uh, gather around him, watching him dink these nine irons. And then he'd give us the nod. And like Border Collies, we'd run off and retrieve the balls. And uh, Is this in a PE lesson? No, no, no. This was at lunchtime. <laughs> but but the, po- the posts were up on the field, and we could always go to the teacher and borrow a rugby ball, you see. So all we did... But lunchtime and playtime was play rugby as well, while Mr. Rin biffed his uh, nine iron golf balls around. I expect teaching was a good bit different in those days. I'm not sure about the risk assessments these days. No, no, probably, <laughs> probably better to move on, I think. And where did it go from there? And so, obviously, your passion there early, you yeah. talked about that with the PE teacher. Where did it go there from the primary, obviously, then the secondary? How did yeah. that go? Again, very, very fortunate. I moved house when I was about nine, um, sort of year five or six. And the secondary school I went to was, um, I think, I think subsequently it's it's um, born a lot of. I think some of the Wigan boys like uh, Gildar and Burgess, I think they went there. Um, Edmund Arrowsmith High School, and again we had a deputy head who was Mr. Northy, who I think was I think was Andy Northy's dad. You remember Andy Northy? Who played yeah, 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 yeah. Northampton, I think it was his father. We had a couple of guys. Mr. Phillips, who went to be the head teacher, played at Oral, a very good player, played north of England. Mr. Little played at Oral. We had Mr. Mayor, who was a centre for Salford Rugby League. We had, do you know, the whole culture of the school was like that. And fortunately for me, um, I, I did every sport I could, football, rugby, cricket, athletics, cross country, as much as I could, simply because I loved it. And there was always that, um, I don't know how strong it is. It was when I was teaching, but there's always that real passion and pride to play for the school team. I think that's been slightly eroded over the years, to be honest. But um, probably as well, there was less junior clubs set up, you know, uh, in the community. There were less community clubs uh, when I was younger. So perhaps uh, the, the greater status was with the schools. So I was surrounded by it. I was surrounded by it, to be honest. So it sounds to me from really, obviously, your dad's influence had a big, big, you know, influence yeah. on you. 
Yeah. What are you saying then? Did, did you join the community clubs as well then, being, you know, in the school team? Did it want you to do that as well or where did you go with that? Yeah, they didn't really exist, Ryan, you know. Uh, the community clubs, if you if you were playing from secondary school age, there was very little transferability then. As there, Unlike now, you had to wait almost till perhaps, not quite open age, but maybe under 16s or something like that before you got into a, a, a you know, a team as such. Um, one of my other dad's influences as well was a, a boxing club. There was a cracky local boxing club, which was fantastic because not only the physical um, fitness and training, the, the guys who ran it uh, were, were really, really good at almost giving you life lessons as well. Bullying wasn't tolerated. Exclusion wasn't tolerated. Being unkind to people wasn't tolerated. So that boxing club early doors was very, very instrumental in, in some probably some early PSHC, you know, CE lessons, really. Um, only good only good positivity was tolerated, as well as that physical stuff. So outside of school, uh, there was... But, but, you know, again, it was, the, it was the age of playing out with your mates. So we used to go and play tennis in the season at the school tennis courts, and we played rugby, football, we made our own games up. And we were all kids and lean as whippets, you know, and there wasn't the culture of going playing there were no computers to play there were no mcdonald's to go to we just played out with each other and that's all we did so you know wow. it was fantastic so you know happy times you know happy yeah, times yeah. right there you Very. see and obviously you see that you know the children that's you know through lockdown and things the fundamental movement skills how the you know they declined and, and the different things and so the passion, the I can just see that it's the influence of your father, then your primary teacher, then your secondary teacher, and then from yeah. there, where did where did you go from there? Did you think teaching was where I wanted it to be, or? Well, if I'm honest, I was I was I would probably describe myself as an able uh, student at school. I was in top groups for things, but I was born idle, and I fell into the trap of thinking I would get by by general knowledge, if you like, and not doing a lot of work. And uh, I started work at 16 in the local housing department at Wigan Council. And all the time I knew deep down I was underselling myself, really. I wasn't, I wasn't you know, achieving what I wanted to do. Um, and I did a few years of that. And I, I literally woke up one morning. I mean, this is a, this is a, a book in itself, this tale. But I, I just thought I've had enough of this. And, and I thought, what can I do now? I, I talk about I, I was headed for a life unfulfilled, I felt. and. Uh, my mum and dad were very, very encouraging and very supportive. And uh, my mum said, I think you make a good teacher. And uh, she always said that from me being young. And, of course, there was no, it was a no-brainer what I was going to teach because the only thing I felt confident to do and felt I had any knowledge or, you know, I wasn't one of these kids who excelled at one particular thing. I, was, I felt I was pretty good at everything. With, and I don't mean that to sound, I, don't, I wasn't very good at anything. I was pretty good at everything, I thought. You know, Smart, really. um, a bit, and you know what they say: if you can't do teach. So, um, uh, fortunately, um, I managed to get a place, um, and and there was a gentleman called Mervyn Beck. And believe it or not, I saw Mervyn in the garage last week in Headingley, and Mervyn was at Carnegie College, and he interviewed me on when I came over from Wigan to be interviewed at college, and I had a really good chat. And I was concerned that I wouldn't get into college because I didn't have the requisite A levels and exam results and all that. And Mervyn was really very reassuring and talked about my life experiences and how valuable they would be as a teacher doing a four-year degree. And rather than um, reinforce my fears, he, he said, no, no, you'll be fine. You'll be fine. And so I started the four-year degree then and uh, on, a, on a Bachelor of Education, which combined my two favourite things, PE and talking. So happy days. <laughs> so so that were heading and that the Leeds Polytechnic then is that, yeah, is that yeah. where it all began and then yeah, the yeah. journey came from there yeah and then there I played uh, rugby league and some of the happiest arguably the happiest four, time, four years of my life I love I love Leeds that's why I stayed here I loved Headingley. I loved playing rugby league we had a very very tight group of rugby league we were a successful side um, in those days and um yeah, I absolutely loved it, and uh, you know, then when, after after I was fortunate enough to get a full time job, and um, and then I really got switched onto it, and from being a bit of a 
chancer, really. I would honestly admit that. I became probably the opposite and I became ultra serious and ultra ultra professional. And uh, we grow up, don't we? And I think the penny dropped that if I was going to be a teacher, I had to be really switched on, really be that role model and, and be that sensible person and try to try to be a bit, a bit better, really. So it's, it's really interesting. So same again, the power of the teacher, and obviously your parents yeah. that support him. Yeah. Yeah. Some of the children, look, we, you know, we work with obviously 12,000 children a week and we know that, you know, every child's got different backgrounds and different challenges. And for them that haven't got that, you know, that positive role model, uh, then the school is the main, yeah. it, it is that security, that that place where they've got that, you know, they know it's there all the time. They know they've got that security there. Absolutely. Uh, so the power of the teachers is massive, isn't it? You know, we did the webinar a few weeks ago now, and and Jason Robinson spoke articulately about about his his journey and uh, how how teachers shouldn't underestimate the power of their influence on young people. And I used to say, if I was running training sessions at, for other teachers at school, you know, you never know what's going on in that child's life, not just in the last half an hour when they roll up late to your lesson, or you know, the last year, week, week, year, whatever it is. And uh, as you rightly say, Ryan, sometimes, you know, your lesson and the chance for them to do well in your lesson and the, in the interaction you have with that child, it might be the only port in a storm they get every week. You never know what's behind. And, uh, you know, that's why we used to talk about just, just showing care and encouragement and positivity and just one little word is often all it takes to either reassure or encourage, or, you know, sometimes as teachers, we're in that changing room of 60 kids all getting changed or on the playing field or whatever. I've probably changed since I had my own kids as well. I think that that probably, I don't know if it softens you, but it certainly makes you think a bit more. And you apply that my child test to things, you know, how would I want my child to be treated? But um, no, I think that I, I was very, very fortunate that from an early age, I had strong people around me who who were influential particularly in sport and PE um yeah, yeah. so you know so obviously with the teachers we know now with obviously the demand especially through COVID there's been lots of different things happening you know just just how it's you know affected the whole the, the curriculum the curriculum but the just what's going on in schools and bubbles and things so there's there's more to go on and risk assessments and health and safety and we find that um as a primary teacher they are really really busy uh so I suppose from the children point in in the lessons we talk about, you know, it's creating that fun that fun learning environment, and obviously we understand that you know primary schools they haven't got the the you know they haven't got the P specialist which the secondaries have, so the importance of skilling them is is huge. Would you agree? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, without wanting to sound disparaging at all, um, I, I mentioned in the webinar my. My wife taught for the same length of the time as me in a primary school, and she was she was terrified sometimes, not terrified, but very apprehensive about teaching PE because she didn't feel skilled enough. She didn't feel she had sometimes the resources, certainly the knowledge, and I would help her a lot trying to you know devise good good quality lessons. And I think that's a picture, um, you know, that, um, that that is probably prevalent across the board. Not, not entirely, because there are some great, as you know, individuals in primary schools who are mad keen on PE and teaching quality lessons day in, day out. But as a as historical broader picture, a broader context, I think there has been a history of let's narrow the curriculum because, you know, the school play, the hall's needed for the school play or it's raining and we can't do that. And, and sometimes staff have been more than happy to... Um, to go along with that because they think, thank goodness I don't have to teach PE. And then, you know, again, as, as you alluded to there, all those key indicators about getting getting kids through the door and what it does, we know now COVID's had a massive impact just yesterday. A couple of days ago, we talk about the gap in numeracy and literacy. And we talk about, we hear on the news about their ability to pay attention. And, you know, what's more important than being physically well you hear people all the time saying if you've if you haven't got your health you've got nothing you know you can have as much money as you like so why aren't we you know why aren't we making it more of a priority why aren't we making PE teachers higher status if you like mm. um why you know why aren't we more invested in that as schools in saying this is an absolute priority 
it's been exacerbated by the last 12 months. Yeah. And I think people are finally switching on to the fact that, look, people's physical and mental well-being is, is suffering here and we need to do something. I think from, you know, from from my experience and uh, what, you, what you're saying there is, you know, 100% and, you know, being a professional sport for 15 years and understanding, you know, getting active and getting the heart rate up and, and that mental health and well-being is huge. And for me, you know, getting the children active in schools early on, getting them switched on, we know the brain chemistry, all that kind of stuff is, is there. So the research is there, obviously. These are big things you can see in Parliament. I know AFP and uh, other youth sport trust are trying to work together to try and you know raise the awareness, which is which is brilliant. But but ultimately for me, it comes down to the people, you know, creating that that experience for these children. So if you're talking about, you know, we're talking about the P in sport, how it can change lives, it's obviously changed yours as from that early age with with you with your dad yeah. and you know, to the to the teachers. What about in schools that you've worked with? Have you seen any examples or we seen wow, this this child here in school is, is really impacting whether it's pee or sport. Yeah, um, yeah, uh, it's. I think I think PE. That again, I was lucky when I was teaching that uh, at Garforth School, school PE and representation of school teams was held in high regard, and uh, there was still, even though community clubs were up and running and thriving, there was still that emphasis on. Um, playing for your school team and, and that kind of thing. And, and there was a, a strong in, inter-school competition. But, you know, to see, to see sometimes kids who didn't necessarily thrive in other areas, thrive in, in PE, was wonderful. And to see them standing up in assemblies and getting the rich rewards that they deserved, not necessarily for coming in, passing exams or coming top in maths, English or whatever it was, or winning the quiz league or whatever. But actually... You know, just acknowledging how well they did in in their own in the stronger area and their chance to succeed was wonderful, really. And certainly from my point of view, I think PE enabled you to have a, a very and this isn't this sounds like I'm sort of uh, putting PE higher than other subjects, but I think it enabled you to have a better relationship, a slightly different relationship with a lot of students. You know, and you find interestingly people like me. The city and the country is full of people like me who've gone into who were PE teachers who interestingly have then gone into pastoral roles uh, in senior leadership and headships. Um, I think because the subject lends to that, because there's that holistic approach. You know, um, it's about phys- physical well-being, mental well-being. It's about um, teamwork. It's about relying on other people. Uh, it's about your responsibility as part of a team. So I think there's that more holistic approach that is just just perfect, and it's very hard to describe. It's very hard to put your finger on it, um, you know. But but I think there's that uniqueness about physical education that uh, that, en- that enables that. Mm. I would agree. The, the, the social element of being together and that teamwork, and you just can't get it in your, in your English lessons. Let's be honest, you know that that real togetherness when it, you know in tough times, like small sided games, and, and you're working together. And we know it, what we're talking about. It's not about being the best player, is it? You know, it's that it's that team and being in that team environment and and working together, enjoying it, and, and working hard for each other. That 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 mentality. Uh, so if we were to stay on the, you know, let's touch on the school, the school's games as far as what you said there, you know, the school's games for you were a driver. I wanted to get in that team. We know in, with the 12, last 12 months, we haven't been able to play the school's games. We know it all, it's some schools compete, some don't. We also hear that some, uh, we don't like the competitive things uh, because it can put children off. There's, there's the fine balance between that. And we've also got the, the schools that are sending the best teams there. So there's a lot of debate. I think, what are your thoughts on, on all them topics? I think um, the way I always did school teams, I like to think I did anyway. And there might be people out there shouting at the screen saying, no, you didn't. You never gave me a game. I would always like to think that, you know, it, it would be inclusive to give, the, to reward those people who show commitment and all those things, you know. But I've come across enough teachers in my time to, they could be 100 nil up and they, they, would, they would still want to beat you 120 nil, you know. So, um I always like to do it and reward people and, you know, not always put your strongest team out just to give people the experience. Don't forget, um, the certainly when I was, the big difference I would say was the, the advent of community clubs and, you know, you would, as I would, if I went to a year seven child perhaps and say, all right, for playing or whatever, 
the game on Wednesday after school, they might say, oh, no, I've got training with whatever club. And it would be quite frustrating because sometimes some clubs were fantastic and saying school comes first because school sh should come first. Um, but obviously, you'd get young people who were eight years of age who had a sideboard full of trophies and medals already at eight years of age, and which is all, which is fine. But you know, there was they, they perhaps the, the community club had a greater pull than the school, um, and, all, and also that you've got the you know the, the, the scholarships and also the performance pathways. We know them eight year old kids could be at Man City, Leeds United doing well, four nights a week, haven't they, as well? Yeah, and I, I had kids at Garforth who were travelling over to Manchester who were on Man United's books. I could I can clearly think of two or three boys now who used to go over there. And and it might be a bit strong sometimes to say they were missold a dream, but you know, I think that was the case with people. The, the clubs had this sort of scattergun approach, uh, trawling as many kids as they could so that the kids could say, Oh, I'm playing for Huddersfield, Chef Wednesday, Bradford City, or whatever, Leeds United. All right, very good, um, but they might soon get discarded. And uh, I'll give you, I'll give you one example. And I hope you don't mind me naming him. He's a famous ex ex uh, golfer, Thor boy, Tom Spur. And Tommy Spur played at Chef Wednesday, Doncaster, at Preston, and and more importantly, before that, Tom was played for every school team that there was going. And and Tom's comes from a lovely family. who's a lovely lad, um, and and. Tom's dad said to me once, um, he said, he, he, I said to him something like, I'm, I'm glad he could play tonight. And his dad said, you know, um, this is where his mates are at school. This is where his mates are. And, uh, you know, lots and lots of students were like that. Some were a little bit more, I can't play. I play for Bradford City or I play for Leeds United. But fortunately, most people would say, yeah, I'll play for school. But an awful lot didn't, to be honest. OK, it's interesting because you've got, as we know, that each decade from, you know, coming back from where, where you started there, back back in Wigan through through the you know, primary into secondary and obviously pushing through now, seeing the children come through. What's been the biggest changes or difference over these last, you know, from 28 years you've been teaching? Have you seen from a fundamental movement skill to just participation? What are you, what's the, what are you seeing there? Yeah, it's a funny one, really, because um, we know that, we know that um, we keep hearing re and reading research about obesity levels and um, activity levels and, and dropping and so on and engagement levels. But what I, what I would say for the last few years of, uh, of teaching, um, I, I wouldn't want people to think I had my rose-coloured glasses on and think that w when I was at school, everybody was a, like a racing whippet and mad keen. You know, there, there were... There were kids out of shape and lazy kids and obese kids when I was at school. Obviously, there were. I think there were fewer. I think there were far fewer. But interestingly, the last couple of uh, years of my teaching career, some of the um, athletes that were coming through from the community or who'd had coaching at community clubs, notably in rugby league and football, in the, those major invasion games, the quality of what we were seeing at year seven was absolutely fantastic. And you know, we talk about the preparedness for the next stage, you know, in, in the in the whole of the national curriculum, we're talking about one of the prerequisites is to prepare the, the young people for the next bit of their life, whether it be a key stage change or whatever it may be. And the transition into year seven, you were, you'd say take a year seven rugby or training group and you'd see these guys doing drills and lads and lasses doing drills and you'd think, wow, the quality is amazing. Now, in fairness, I think the community clubs would take response, you know, credit for that. But that was really good where you could say, right, I'll have a look, I'll have a look at where they are. And you might think, you know what? I can, I can, I can accelerate this a little bit. I can, I can take these guys and lads and lasses on a bit quicker because they've come to me in, in good shape. They, you know, so real quality. And and like I say, I suspect that was uh, an input of quality coaches from from community clubs at a young age, I would suggest. That's it's really um, so you've got a difference. Have you got them top end that going that way and then the bottom end down here though? Well, maybe, yeah. Um and and you know, you talk to kids and it used to be I know I'm getting on, but it used to be different languages. I I I'm I've never had a go to a computer game. Can you believe that? I've never sat there and done the old computer game. So it's hard. Uh, oh, <laughs> <you know. laughs> I'm too old for even those, I think. But uh, so all that's alien to me. It completely is alien to me. But um 
Yeah, there was. There's certainly. Um, I don't know. Perhaps, perhaps it's fair to say youngsters are less able to sustain that physical activity nowadays. Perhaps, you know. Um, I'm a, I'm I'm a bad one to ask because I was one of these kids who was was sport Billy who was interested in you know everything and sport and would always have a go at stuff and ran everywhere and you know if if we went to training we used to we used to run we never had lifts off our pair my mum and dad didn't have a car so in you'd either call the bus or you ran and me and my mate would say should we jog it to training and you might run. You know, I don't want it to sound like the Hobbies advert, but you might run <laughs> yeah, two or three miles to training Brilliant. because that's what you did. You know, wow. but it was a different, different age. So, if you could have one thing, you, you would, you would, you know, a bit, one bit of advice that you'd say to, you know, teachers, you know, in the primary schools that we know, we know the power of the the P and sport that can yeah. change lives. What would it be? I would say embrace it. I would say take every opportunity from people like yourselves and firms like yourselves with good coaches. And rather than rather than you know we all get a, that that dreaded black cloud of self doubt, don't we, in our lives? And rather than embrace that, ignore that and think, right, how am I going to be able to better impart knowledge to these young people so that when they do get to year six or whatever it is, that they're better, re- you know, they're ready. And I think the teachers not only would they go up in the estimation of the children, but they would feel empowered. You know, when they instead of saying, I don't know anything about basketball, rugby, football, whatever, upskill themselves, use use companies like yourselves and coaches that, that work for you and really embrace it because you know, we do need our children in better shape physically and mentally. We do need them more ready for the next bit of their life. Um, and you know, they're not they're not getting it elsewhere sometimes. Sometimes it is their only opportunity to physically enjoy themselves. And that, as well as as well as that, as well as the teacher embracing it, be positive, show care, be you know, put a smile on your face, show those children that, that they cared for and loved. And anybody who was taught by me might be listening to this and laughing their head off because I was one of the strictest teachers, unashamedly I was. But I would say at the same time, I hope people felt that I cared for them as well, you know. Um, and and I would say those two things really. Don't be frightened of upskilling yourself, and and really approach it and say, right, I'm gonna I'm gonna teach rugby today or basketball today. I'm not gonna use an excuse not to. So that, and also also really show care and enthusiasm and detail because those kids will remember it. As Jason Robinson said, you know, we all remember it from from our every single one of us could remember our first lessons when we were really really young, and that one teacher or those couple of teachers that made us think this is great fun. I love this. Brilliant. Okay. Well, listen. It's been really, really, really pleasing and uh, really interesting to hear. You know where the journey started. You know, to, you know to where you are now. So, thank, thank you for coming on board uh, and and telling you and telling your story. And look out for for it on the on the YouTube channel, P Pro right. Podcast. Thank Thanks you very much for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the podcast. If you want any more information on the P Pro app, visit pproapp.com for a free 14-day trial. Thank you.